Hello, my name's Heather and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. I'm really happy to have with me two interviewees today um, and we're going to talk all things Labour Files, um, what that documentary meant, what its implications are, where we're at now and we, we, I couldn't think of two better people to do that with than um, Richard Sanders who was behind the second episode in Labour Files which is the one which focuses on anti-Semitism, and Huda Amari, who's one of the main interviewees in that, um, that program, and also co-founder of Palestine Action. So we'll talk about that then. So hello, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Excited cool. to be here. Yeah. So let's kick off with, like, way back when you were just thinking about this program and when you were, Huda, when you were invited on, what were you hoping would happen through making Labour Files? Well, Huda, you go first. Well, I think um, when I was invited to, to speak, I was a little bit nervous, I have to be honest, more nervous than I would normally be doing interviews because I think the topic on anti-Semitism for Palestinians is quite, um, it brings back a lot of bad memories, uh, to say the least. And it's always, it's, it's, it's kind of something that's constantly reoccurring and it's a weapon that's used against you. But I was excited that this project was being taken on to look at really the details of what was going on so the truth could come to light because we've always had people fighting back on it on different fronts. But I think having it in one place uh, was really helpful for us to be able to not just move on, but also to reflect and see exactly what happened uh, throughout that time and, and how we can deal with it going, going forward. I was very excited by it. I'd been trying to get something done for some time on, you know, just an alternative perspective on the, uh, the Labour Party anti-Semitism story, uh, particularly once the leaked report had come out, you know, the, the, the report the Labour Party itself did, which actually told a quite remarkable and very different story and was largely ignored um, by the media. Obviously, you know, on one level, it's been a disappointment in that it's been entirely ignored by the British media, pretty much entirely ignored. Um, that was to be expected, really. I mean, a, a film which says that the British media had covered this story entirely wrong was hardly going to be embraced by the British media. I, I've said before, what's always slightly shocked me is while I think we were unlucky with our timing as well, we, we came out just as the government imploded and, you know, the the the, the Labour Party was, was triumphant and it was clearly looking as if it was heading towards forming government and so on. No one was particularly in the mood for looking back and raking over the coals of the um, uh, of the Corbyn era. I, I, in my own film, the second film, I'd made quite a strong focus on that panorama, um, the, the Is Labour Anti-Semitic panorama, because I think it was very important. I mean, really, there are two pillars uh, of the campaign against Corbyn. There are two things that destroy him. One is that film, the other is the EHRC um, report. And, you know, I thought we raised very, very important questions about that panorama. Um, you know, there seemed to be things in it which were just straightforwardly wrong, other things which were clearly, you know, very poor um, journalistic practice. And I've been, I have been a little shocked the degree to which the BBC has just cynically put its head down and, and just ignored us and relied on the fact that um, the media wasn't going to pick it up and therefore it didn't need to worry about it. It does make one very sceptical about the BBC when it does, you know, does its periodic bouts of, of self-flagellation and, you know, its high journalistic standards. You, you realise that if it can get away with it, it's not going to fess up to mistakes at all. Yes, it's somewhat ironic that the BBC has now launched a misinformation unit, which is doing everything but looking at itself. Yeah, um, myself and others have written to that that journalist and pointed out that you know really really to have credibility, she needs to look at the panorama. I mean, she is you know one one of these journalists who tend to regard any criticism or challenge as toxic trolling, which occasionally it is, uh, you know, particularly there's the misogyny that comes into these things. Um, but she, she she doesn't really seem particularly responsive. So Huda, I want to come back to what you were saying, which is a little bit like, you know, it is disappointing, as Richard says, it hasn't really had more impact on the media, but not surprising. But in terms of like, giving us a sense of having something in one place that we can look at, 
I definitely got that from not just that episode, but the whole of the Labour Files. And how do you feel about, about that? Yeah, yeah. And I can see it on a macro level that, you know, the mainstream media didn't pick it up and they didn't get the um, the platform and also people, you know, looking at it and, and recognising their own mistakes. But I think within the movement overall, it definitely had a massive impact. And I think it was quite empowering to have something like that, where so many people had been, you know, called conspiracy theorists or whatever else. And suddenly there was something really well put together. You know, I was really impressed by the end result. Um, and obviously, I didn't know all of these documents that were going to come out and all the information. So it was incredible to see all of that put so well together in one place. I think for the movement, it definitely had um, a positive impact. And I guess I um, and I guess when you're in this kind of movement, you're almost sort of in a bubble. So you kind of like, you know, you, you you see it all around you. Right. So for you, it's absolutely everywhere. But um, the people who are kind of pushing the you know the the, the anti-Semitism accusations um, from the mainstream media are probably going to be the last ones to be able to um, admit to their mistakes. Um, but I think as well the fact that I was really pleased to be um, one of you know and Alkaz Akami was also on there who's brilliant um, Palestinians on the show because so much of what happened at that time during Labour. Um, you know, I joined the Labour Party in 2015 because I saw it as a vehicle for, for change and hope and that, you know, for Palestine um, and, and for foreign policy that we could actually have a positive change. And then suddenly it all happened quite quickly where it felt like everything was on anti-Semitism and you couldn't talk about Palestine anymore. It was either is it anti-Semitic or is it not? And then the, the Palestine element of things got taken away and so I feel like now we're getting back to recognizing that and, and moving forward um, on this topic and are better equipped to also defend ourselves and each other. Yeah that was one thing which I think is I mean apart from just getting everything in one place and not yeah. being gaslit by media for once one thing which Labour Files does which is really important is to bring Palestinian voices like you say yours and Radha's into the discussion and I thought it would be good to talk about how, Richard, you made a decision to do that um, and what impact both of you feel it had, you know, and how you felt also Huda being one of those voices and what you felt you wanted to say. Oh, I was really pleased to be asked, to be honest, because I think um, it wasn't necessarily a, a natural choice, I don't think, um, to have me on when talking about this topic because I hadn't necessarily been on uh, the receiving end of suspensions or being expelled, but had been in terms of campaigning wise and our effectiveness and ability to impact change. Um, so I was I was really pleased that, that the Palestinian voice was was there, um, and and also you know, there's there's so many good people in the movement, so many good people who have been slandered, and what I saw at the time was that. When, when anti-Semitism was being used as an accusation, it was making uh, Palestine campaigning very reactive. And so we were forced to react to the accusations of anti-Semitism rather than, you know, the other way around. And we're talking about Palestine and, and being at the forefront of the campaign. So it really pushed us back quite, quite a lot at that time. And that's something that I felt was happening constantly because people had to defend themselves, defend each other against these accusations. And it became much more difficult uh, to, to talk about Palestine um, without being constantly uh, reminded of these accusations and the weaponization of anti-Semitism, which became hand in hand with Palestine campaigning because of the, the, the level of how much it was being used against, against us and, and other people um, in the movement. So I think having the ability to also talk about the Great Return March in 2018 and the contrast between what was happening then and in the um, and you know the IHRA definition being passed at the same time, um, I, I was really pleased that that was that was included in the show, and also being able to be um, honest about things as well. That um, you know at the time we were trying to defend Corbyn as much as possible, but um, and still to this day, but it was it was. Great to be able to just be honest about saying, you know, I wish 
I wish that um, Corbyn at the time stuck up a bit more and talks about Palestine a bit more at the time and wasn't so uh, apol apologetic on things, which I understand he was forced into, but, you know, it didn't it didn't work out well either way. It really didn't, no, and we can definitely come on to that. Yeah, Richard, talk about your your take on that, because obviously you were you made that decision. Well, I was very glad to have uh, Rada and, and Huda on. I mean, part of me thinks, you know, why only two Palestinian voices? But you were both so good <laughs> that I didn't need um, more. I mean, you both were really exceptional interviewees. I mean, I've known Rada for a few years and, um, you know, she, she's always fascinating. Um, I mean, originally I'd written a piece called The Wrong Sort of Jew, which was all around interviews with, with, with the Jewish people. And to a degree, you know, to push back on this at all, you, you had to do it from, you know, through the voices of um, Jewish people. And then once you gained a tiny foothold and were allowed to do that, you could perhaps progress further and, and actually get Palestinian voices. I mean, the, the absence of Palestinian voices, which you talk about in the film, Huda, which wasn't for want of trying, I mean, you know, Palestinians, you know, always always want to be heard, it was profoundly important. In the film, James Schneider, who worked in Corbyn's office, is very honest about this, and Alex Nunn's was as well. I didn't use Alex Alex's clip, but he was very honest. The basic problem they had, once you come to the crunch, and the crunch is always about the IHRA definition, all of these campaigns always drive relentlessly towards compelling people to, uh, to adopt the IHRA, which is in itself revealing. Once you came to the crunch in September 2018, they were both very frank. You had daily um, pressure in the media from the Jewish labor movement, Labor Friends of Israel, the Board of Deputies, etc., etc., etc. Palestinian voices were just absent. Uh, and they were absent because the media ignored them. But it meant that politically, as James Schneider said, it was simply impossible not to adopt the IHRA. And that's a reflection of power, uh, you know, and uh, of people's power to protect their own voices, their power to be heard. And really a party that sees itself as a progressive party ought to be more sensitive to things like that and, and to the, the power of, of sidelining people and just robbing them of their voice. And that's what happened. I mean, you know, there were, there were two things that happened. There were two groups essentially that came together. There was the, the center and the right, which wanted to destroy Jeremy Corbyn. And then, you know, the, the Israel lobby, which wants to destroy the, the Palestinian cause. And this whole thing became turbocharged because those two things came together. And to a degree, the Palestinian cause to a degree was collateral because suddenly it was was an enormously useful weapon with which to destroy Jeremy Corbyn. And the fact that uh, the, the Palestinian cause was, was so sort of decimated for a few years was sort of incidental to those people. Yeah, I think so still to this day. I mean, I know I'm um, taking a different route now to talk about later, but I think still to this day, there is a massive fallout for the Palestinian cause because of the Corbyn uh, time, I think that's un undeniable that a lot of people are still hesitant or nervous to get involved or to speak out because they saw what happened um, at that time. So I still think it has a, a lingering effect. Yeah, I agree. And also just the way in which that battle was around the IHRA, it makes it very difficult for anybody at all to refuse to adopt the IHRA. And once you have, then that becomes a massive weapon against any kind of speech on Palestine, pretty much. Clause seven of the IHRA, the, the seventh example where you are not allowed to describe Israel as a racist endeavor, is a very fundamental and clear attempt to rob Palestinians of their right to define their history over the last century. And the central experience of the Palestinian people, you know, and, and tell me if you disagree, but uh, over the last century is the racism of the Zionist project. And to outlaw people from being allowed to even say that could, could, be, could not be a more fundamental denial of Palestinian rights and of, you know, a, a, a more fundamental disempowerment of the Palestinian cause. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's definitely true. And I think it's it's obvious when you read that clause as well, the political motivations behind it to protect uh, to protect Israel from criticisms. And by you know, when they talk about the racist endeavor part, you know, we're talking about the Nakba in 1948 and something that we is ongoing and uh, has been going on for 75 years. And this is when 
you know, Palestinians were systematically forced out. 750,000 Palestinians were driven out of their homes, villages, hundreds of villages destroyed and families massacred simply because they were Palestinian and to make way um, for, for, the, for the new Jewish state. I mean, forcing people out of their homes simply based on, you know, who they are is the very definition of, of racism. And, and I think there's a, you know, they don't want people talking about what was happening in 1948 because it's still going on to this very day. It's never, um, it's never ended. And actually, it might be a bit of a, you know, side, uh, side point, but I remember in 2018 as well, there were two motions that were passed um, which was great to see. One was on the arms embargo between the UK and Israel, and one was on uh, recognizing the Nakba and refugees' right to return. And there was political lobbying behind the scenes by you know, prominent people at the time, like Emily Thornberry, who wanted to take out the part on the Nakba and to take out the part on the arms embargo, which asked for an arms embargo. Um, so it was about completely, you know, and then I think that was a lot of, you know, whatever you think of the individuals was at the time, they just really didn't want to have anything going through, which was going to have an impact because it was constant, the attacks that they were, that they were getting. But at the same time, seeing what was happening in Palestine, um, it's at the same time, and also speaking on Palestine platforms, saying that they express solidarity with Palestinians. I mean, it's, it's unforgivable in, in my, in my eyes. The, the the problem the thing about the anti-Semitism charge is 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 that it is so toxifying in in the European left wing and liberal and centrist tradition uh, the the anti the charges of anti-Semitism are so redolent of past horrors they're so triggering uh, for Jewish people uh, but also for you know anyone who regards themselves in any way uh, progressive that it's an enormously powerful weapon to wield I mean I think to a degree there's a problem that once that charge is leveled. People rather switch their brains off. No one wants to be on the wrong side of that debate. And, and I think this is a thing that isn't talked about enough. It, it, if you're going to do to the Palestinian people what Zionism has done to the Palestinian people, as with all colonial endeavors, you have first to dehumanize them. Uh, you, you have to dehumanize people before you can brutalize them. And there is nothing, you can't imagine anything which is more effective at dehumanizing Palestinians than the charge of anti-Semitism. Once you've taken them away from the sort of, the, the sort of developing wor world colonial sort of paradigm and lumped them into the traditional paradigm of European anti-Semitism, you've turned them into something completely different. And, and it suddenly becomes that bit more acceptable to do to the Palestinians what, what has been done to them. And I think it's, you know, that's why I've always reacted against this so strongly, because it's always seemed to me very clear that it facilitates the dehumanization uh, and the delegitimization of the Palestinian struggle without which the, the the brutality and the atrocities which are committed against the Palestinian people are not possible. Mm. Yeah but I've been <laughs> looking particularly at, at Germany where I think that's most extreme where obviously Germans are because of uh, because of the Holocaust incredibly sensitive around anti-Semitism but rather than deal with and confront that and mm. their colonial their broader colonial past and imperial past they um um Put, they project anti-Semitism onto to the ethnic other, not just to Palestinians, but to, to Muslim immigrants generally. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes like really a toxic um, and dehumanizing as, experience. It's probably very most intense there. As, as white Gentile uh, um, Europeans and North Americans, what we do is we franchise out our own guilt yeah. to a vulnerable and blameless people. And it's, it's unconscionable. Yeah. And in Germany recently as well, there was a protest for Nakba 75, and it was organised by a Jewish group, um, and they were all arrested for, for shouting free Palestine. You know, it's kind of showing, um, you know, it, they, but the fact that they're actually arresting Jews for anti-Semitism because they're shouting free Palestine now at this point. Yeah, I'm going to put some links to all the stuff that we discuss, I mean, obviously the programme and, and also to stuff that's going on in Germany, if you want to know more, in the description box below. So if you want to follow up, you can. But let's let's go back to something you were saying about you know, Emily Thornberry at conference, trying to control the bad media attention by cutting mm -hmm. the controversial stuff out of the motion. So there was a clear strategy 
which is, was was concessionary was thinking we can we can take the edge of these accusations if we make concessions to um to uh, for want of a better term zionist lobby within the uk um and, and particularly the kind of jewish establishment organizations and the people who were using those as a kind of front for their anti-corbinism i mean that that clearly didn't work so mm -hmm. i kind of like to move on to thinking about what might have worked what we think what we can do now what we can learn from what happened for me when i was in labor there was the whole period in 2018 which i think was a an interesting conference because so much had happened. The, the two parts time motions were passed. She wasn't successful in taking out those key parts because the people who were pushing it refused to change the contents of those motions. Um, but at the same time, there was no, I remember being very frustrated because there was no impact. And I was like, well, what happens now? Right? We've got a motion passed in the Labour Party the conference. You know, it was there was an amazing show of solidarity at that place. It showed that majority of Labour members did stand with Palestine, um, but were just being were being silenced. And that what was the next step to actually make this policy? And um, I was astonished to see in 2019 when on the Labour Party manifesto they had the arms embargo between uh, the UK and Israel, which was uh, crucial. Um, to be honest, and it was the first time it ever happened in political history. I mean, I and so many others were ecstatic to see that because being on the manifesto actually means that they are, that they're more compelled to actually make it happen if they get onto power, because a lot of party motions ever get onto the manifesto. But obviously we saw, um, we saw what happened at that conference, um, so on the general election in 2019, and the fallout from that, and Keir Starmer get elected. So for me, it wasn't, uh, soon after that, that I'd um, left the the Labour Party. For me, it was, you know, the Corbyn time was an exception. And I'd always seen every political party, every government as in some way complicit with what was happening to the Palestinian people um, and or, or in other places in the Middle East and across the world. So I couldn't be involved in it. So for me, I, uh, it was soon after that that myself and others started taking direct action um, against Israeli weapons factories uh, in this country, which um, which which involved forming Palestine Action and Network, and really there was many different motivations from different people. Um, I think for myself, a key thing was seeing how the democratic process had failed when it had come to towards so many things, but especially for uh, the Palestinian people, and feeling like the, the political road is closed for us. Um, and that we had to do something drastic and it had to be different and take a more direct route in order to essentially impose our own arms embargo. Yeah, yeah, I think we could I'd definitely talk a bit more about Palestine action, um, because I think a lot of us are really inspired by what you're doing. Um, and it is like one of the things, one of the few things happening in politics, which seems to be having uh, an effect. Um, but yeah, but Richard, before we do that, do you want to kind of come in on on that lessons to be learned, what went wrong? Because you really saw those documents and you must have really had a lot of thought about, about that. Yes, I mean, lessons to be learned. I think there are really important lessons to be learned, certainly both for the left, um, for, for the left, I think primarily. I mean, I'm not, I don't, it's not for me to tell the, the Palestinian movement what, what it needs to learn. Uh, but um, firstly, the strategy that was employed of apology and appeasement clearly didn't work. Uh, and was never was never going to work. I mean, the more you you sort of apologised, the, 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 the simply the, the, the goalposts were moved in t each time. Was it Len McCluskey said they won't take yes for an answer? You know, uh, but but I think more importantly, um, the whole framing of the debate, whereby the anti-racist spotlight is being shone not towards the apartheid state and its supporters and apologists, but away from the apartheid state and towards its victims and their supporters. Now, the, you, you have to push back right from the beginning. The, the minute the debate is framed like that, you're onto a loser, you're, you're, you're never gonna win. They're very instructive to watch, for example, how Amnesty deals with this. Amnesty just doesn't get sucked into this. It sticks to international law, it sticks to the issue of Palestine, and it just, it, it just ignores accusations of, of anti-Semitism and just sticks rigidly to the issues of Palestinian rights and international law. And I think that's what you have to do. And I think you have to say, look, if you're gonna 
given that what I'm doing here is standing up against a, a brutal apartheid system as defined by all of the world's uh, international human rights organizations, your evidence has to be really strong. Otherwise you are clearly disempowering and oppressed people and facilitating their oppression. And I think you just cannot, you cannot get sucked into the debate on the same terms that Corbyn allowed himself to be sucked into that debate. Yeah, it's remarkable. Like that this thing which is supposed to be anti-racist is quite the opposite, right? That it, it's almost like hard to, it's hard to even engage with the mainstream debate on this because it's so no. absurd, right? You, you have to be at the very least an apologist for apartheid or you're a racist. I mean, it's absurd. It's complete. It's a sort of intellectual moral cul-de-sac that the entire British media political establishment has steered itself into. And at some point it's going to have to come out of because it's untenable. But I also think the reason that it's, it's because it's so absurd makes it an effective tool for those who want to silence us, because it is so disturbing to be accused of being racist, especially when you dedicate yourself to anti-racist campaigning, to, you know, in my context, fighting against the apartheid state of Israel and, and, and um, fighting against discrimination. To be accused of it is, is so... Um, distracting because you do feel the ne the need to have to defend yourself and I think that's why you know it is so effective and that's why they try to use it again and again against people on the left you know against Jewish activists as well who are you know been dedicating their whole lives to campaigning against racism um, because it does take people away from that and they're forced into position where they have to um, defend themselves but I completely agree I think you know the um the, the apologizing for things and, and hoping that it would go away obviously proved not to be true. And I think also there's a level of when people are being accused of anti-Semitism um, and it's being weaponized against them, of feeling the need to examine every single word and text that was ever written, um, rather than looking at the whole picture and how it's being used again and again, because that's kind of like how it how it also works. But I think the other the other issue of what was happening at the time is that once someone's smeared with that, um, sometimes it's just like there's no smoke without fire, right? If they keep saying it again and again and again, then no one even remembers what they said, just that they've been labelled as an anti-Semite. And I think a lot of people were scared of being going through that themselves, so wouldn't talk up about it or wouldn't speak up about it at the time. And so I think those are some key things that went wrong and things that we can... Um, we can learn from as well. Yeah, that truth by repetition is insane, isn't it? Like if you just keep mm -hmm. saying it and saying it and saying it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, in the accusation of anti-Semitism is very damaging. I think it's probably less damaging if you're Jewish because you don't Oops. kind of go through that five, you know, period of thinking, I wonder if I am anti-Semitic. You kind of just know you're not. I think that's kind of an interesting difference that I've seen between like Jewish people who get accused and people who are non-Jewish, but there is a kind of, as you say, left is very vulnerable to that, does self-examine, does think, I wonder if I inadvertently did this. And particularly the way it's done, it's done in a very kind of confusing way where things are taken out of context. So we've seen it with this film, The Big Lie. You just take the title and that becomes, divorced from anything else, evidence of anti-Semitism. Um, and people on the left are hand-wringing about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how, even now, if you haven't seen the structures and the patterns now, and you don't understand that this is nothing to do with the title, I don't know what to say, really, if, if that makes sense. I, I kind of get frustrated with bits of the left who are still not clear about what's going on. I think part of the difficulty is as well, because in my film, I always avoided using the word lies and smears. I, I think one of the very important things to, to grasp in this that it is, is that it is so effective as a weapon to be wielded against both the Palestinian cause and the radical left mm. because most of the sort of foot, foot soldiers believe it. You know, you, I, you know, I have endless conversations with what might be called liberal Zionists. And, you know, they're, they're frequently very critical of Israel or appalled by Netanyahu and the occupation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But th there is simply a mental block. And it's why they're so uncomfortable talking about 1948. They'll talk about 1967, but not 1948. And the, 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 the sort of concept 
of Zionism itself being a problem is something they really struggle with. And I think they do instinctively feel that people who are anti-Zionist are in some way at the very least suspect on this. And, I, and I, you know, the conversation we need to have, I think is probably not about lies and smears. The conversation we need to have is about Zionism. You know, the Western world has, has just has a blind spot about Zionism. It, it does not confront the reality of what Zionism is, which is a, which is a racist ethno state. And I think that's the conversation we have to have. And it's so powerful as a weapon because so many people do do genuinely believe it. They, they do think this is anti-Semitic. Yeah, indeed. So maybe we can move on to something a bit more hopeful, um, which is like what we do now. And we kind of started that conversation um, with Palestine Action. I think a lot of us have done that kind of thing of like, what the fuck happened? Being a bit kind of traumatized by the whole Corbyn period and doing something very different. Um, so not there are some people who've gone into electoral politics through another party, but most of us have gone into grassroots stuff of some kind or another. So tell us a little bit about Palestine action, the decisions you made, how it's going, and and how you see it comparing with with the Labour Party. Yeah, and I think well, so as I mentioned before, we target um, Israeli weapons factories. So specifically, our main target is Albert Systems, which is Israel's largest weapons firm who actually used to have 10 sites um, across this country, which is a lot for such a small uh, country relative to other countries in Europe um, and, and other places as well. But they will actually, Elbert Systems will use Gaza and Palestine um, as a way to develop their weapons. So every time we see attacks on Gaza, like in 2014, um, when there was a, a massive bombardment, they took 2,200 Palestinian lives, they were testing out new drones, um, armed drones, which they'll go on to market as battle tested, and then they build them across across this country. So for me, one of the main things that was, I think, a priority for the Palestine movement was an arms embargo. And the route for that, at the time, the closest we ever got to that through the political process was the Labour Party, was through Jeremy Corbyn's uh, leadership at the time. And I think when that went, um, it pushed us to take a, a different route. And for me, that was direct action. And I think as well, for, I found it to be extremely uh, empowering because I hadn't, I didn't have to ask someone else to create change. I didn't have to lobby MPs, which I did a lot of, <clears throat> which was very painful, I have to say, um, you know, to try and create these changes. It was going straight to the source and immediately seeing that you could have a direct result on the impact um, and stop these factories from operating. And we did in January 2022, they were forced to shut down uh, their uh, factory in Oldham, which was not far from where I used to grow up. Um, so that was that was nice to see. And then in the summer, they were um, forced out of their London headquarters and they've since lost hundreds of millions in um, hundreds of millions of pounds in contracts um, as well. So it has been has been very empowering. It comes with its own challenges, uh, you know, with repression by the state. But I think the fact that, you know, taking the power back into your own hands quite literally and being able to take such action and seeing the direct impact and also seeing the impact for Palestinians in Gaza. We had um, last year, they painted, Palestinian artists in Gaza painted a mural on the wall there um, uh, on Palestine action, which was really, really warming to see. And I think because it's it's putting Palestine at the center of it and it's the forefront of what we're of what we're doing. And so I think that as well for Palestinians both here and in Palestine to see um, something really proactive um, is very um, hard one for people to see. And you know we're keeping going. We've got lots of sites to shut down. Uh, lots more to do but it's um it's exciting developments and exciting place an exciting place to be yeah it totally gets you away from that obsession with being smeared which i think a lot of us including myself is kind of still trapped in i remember reading the jewish chronicle hit pieces on mm -hmm. palestine action and thinking they do not realize how they've made this sound really cool <laughs> <laughs> there's a chaos planned around which was like this sounds great <laughs> like you had celebrities yeah. there and you were like having you know it was sounded really active and and I think yeah it was really interesting that the smearing itself 
obviously it works for the people its target audience but it didn't really work beyond that at any level at all um i think it's very difficult for them when it comes to targeting weapons factories you know because if you and they have tried to do this but not not on a massive level if you try and say well this is if you try and throw the accusation of anti-semitism it just doesn't really stick because yeah. if this is again it's weapons factories who are um, who are using these weapons against Palestinians, developing them on Palestinians and exporting them across the world, and to in any way imply that to, that is racist, it's just so obvious, and you can see through it. So I think that um, it hasn't really worked for them. And that hit piece, actually, is probably just a coincidence, but they, um, well, I'm not sure if it was, because they released it on my birthday, and they put my new age, because I turned 28, so it was released on the morning of that, so they probably knew. Um, but they wrote to me asking for a comment and said, you said Israel is a racist state uh, like three years ago on Facebook. And I've probably said it a lot more since then. And that was what they came out with. And they changed it in the article to say she said Israel is a racist endeavor. I mean, either way, it doesn't really matter. But it just showed how they were clutching onto straws to try and um, to try and tarnish uh, what we were, what we were doing, and, and yeah. this is why they want to talk about anti-Semitism, because if the if the conversation is where it should be, which is about Palestine, they know they haven't got a leg to stand on. Much better to be talking about anti-Semitism. Yeah, I mean, I think your example there is like of this kind of Israel as a racist state. It's just so desperate. The things they get you on are so pathetic that actually this is part of the way in which maybe we win a few people over. People see that and say. That doesn't seem so outrageous. And I think like that kind of comes across in the film. And were, were you thinking about that when you made the film, Richard, about trying to show how absurd the accusations were? Well, we certainly wanted to put Palestine center stage and we have footage of the Great March of Return, the, the, the appalling footage of the attack on Shreen Abu Akhli's, um coffin. Yeah. Um, and and it, it, Palestine was sort of taken out of the debate um when you had the labor anti-semitism thing so we were we were certainly very very keen um to put palestine back center stage in that film yes let's just end by thinking about how this might we might go on from here in terms of yeah it hasn't had much impact so far labor files but it has on some people some journalists have taken up different bits of it um so talk about that and talk about how you might, do you feel it might impact slowly? Is there a kind of movement that's that it's supporting and, and emboldening? I, I, I think, um, and I'd be interested to get Huda's thoughts on, on this. I Sometimes I think it's just glacially slow and the, it'll take decades before the Western world actually grasps the issue as it should be grasped. Other times I think sometimes you know, perhaps we'll make it, wake up one morning and there'll be an emperor's new clothes moment. I think it, what is very clear is that the political and media establishment is out of out of touch with the broader public. Now, it, you know, in as much as the broader public thinks about it at all or has an opinion of it at all, I think it is sympathetic to the Palestinians. I mean, it's just so patently appalling what is being done to the Palestinians. And, and I think, um, you know, there might come a, a sort of tipping point when suddenly people sort of grasp uh, what's going on here. In terms of the, the labor files, to a large degree, I was making it for posterity. I was making it, I mean, the next time, and there will be a next time that the, Palestinian, the, the Israelis feel the need to sort of club the Gaza Strip into submission this thing will be moved center stage and people who get very angry and upset about that will be accused of being anti-semites uh, and you know i hope people at that point will will return to the film i mean in terms of the immediate impact essentially what happened combined with the interview i did with martin ford um a few months later which was, yeah. was important i mean this was the man who was appointed to by by starmer to look into these issues and he really you know essentially came down in broad terms, came down on our side. Now, the combination of those two things meant that we we sort of got the left element of the Guardian commentariat on board. You know, Owen Jones interviewed myself and Peter. George Monbiot um, tweeted quite powerfully on this. Nazarene Malik 
uh, has mentioned it. Navarra Media, in the immediate uh, wake of the film being transmitted, did a bit of a mea culpa, to be honest, uh, on elements of this. So I think we have shifted the ground a little bit. We've expanded the bubble where we're all talking to each other a bit on this one, but there's a hell of a long, long way to go. Yeah, and I, I think you covered a lot of ground there. And I think because it captured such an important time in British politics, that it's not something which is just a one-off, that, you know, as you said, in years to come, it, it will be looked back on and people will understand what was happening at that time, which I think is so crucial uh, to have it. And even if, you know, a lot of mainstream media aren't uh, ready or won't cover it now, it doesn't mean that when something else happens in the future, that there's this whole load of evidence to showing what's happened before um, that will that will come out, and I think as well for uh, for Palestinians and people across the movement, it was it, it was refreshing to see, um, especially how it was done as well, and the fact that it did include what was happening in Palestine at the time, um, and these other and these other conversations which weren't happening during Corbyn's time. I think that it is something that is timeless, essentially, and even if and you get different, you know goes at it basically a bit getting out there to a to a bigger audience but from what I saw you know I would go to um different events um not always on Palestine I'll be in different venues with kind of lefty spaces and lots of people uh, younger people who wouldn't necessarily who are very pro-Palestine but wouldn't want to talk about the anti-semitism smears were talking about it I felt really confident talking about it and, and saying, well, this is what was happening. This is how it was used to silence the debate on Palestine, et cetera. You would normally uh, be more worried about engaging in those type of conversations, but would be OK talking about Palestine, just not about what happened um, during Labour and the accusation of anti-Semitism. I think there's a generational thing, isn't there? Because the BBC has decided just to, you know, hope it all goes away. In part because, you know, the Observer hasn't written about it. You know, I, if you are getting your media from social media, which most people under 40, I think, do, then you probably are aware of it. And you you, you certainly probably are aware of the um, the case against the panorama. So, and so I think it's generational, you know, that that as that generation grows older and perhaps moves into positions of power and so on, I think there's a seed that has been planted there, which I, I hope in 10 years' time will have some effect. That's a nice optimistic note to end on. So I want to thank you both, not just for this interview, but Richard for making um, a film that's really great for a lot of us. I mean, when The Labour Files was on, I was on a high for about 48 hours because suddenly there was something that validated the experience that I had had as an activist in Labour Party and Huda for also you know when that that factory shut down again I was I was on a high for a, a while um, because a lot of us were we were just like really inspired by it so thank you for, for what you do and thank you for a great conversation thank, thank you, you.